Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So one of the things that's happened in the last couple of years during COVID-19 is a lot of people have sort of given new thought to what they want to do in life. And I ran across a fascinating uh, young lady, uh, Ivana Stryan, is that correct? Ivana Stryan, in official Serbian, but yeah, Ivana Stryan is the Ivana size. <laughs> She's a Serbian-Canadian filmmaker. She left her career in corporate strategy to pursue a creative career as an independent writer, director, and editor. Sounds interesting. So, so Ivana, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your transition from corporate strategy uh, to, uh, to this creative career. Sure. Uh, well, I had always wanted to be a filmmaker, actually. I really wanted to go to film school. Uh, but when I thought about the investment that film school would require and uh, the potential ROI, it just didn't look, um, you know, it just really, uh, I wasn't convinced. I wasn't uh, 100% sure of the success rate, which was not the right way to look at it. So I ended up getting a commerce degree, uh, kind of understanding that entertainment is a business at the end of the day. And I had pursued corporate strategy. That was something that was my day job. Uh, and on the side, I had was always pursuing my passion. I was writing, I took screenwriting courses, I was making short films of my own, as well as working on other people's short films. I uh, was a production manager for a number of Canadian Film Centre short films and basically had decided that it was time to kind of take the leap. And I ended up going back to school, getting a master's degree uh, in media ventures, which is very much the business side of the entertainment industry. And through that program, I had internships that were in development, uh, as well as in TV and podcast production. And then that really kind of gave me the confidence uh, to, you know, the, the understanding of the industry and the confidence to uh, go out on my own uh, as a screenwriter and a filmmaker. So that's Fantastic. a little bit about Sounds my like story. Quite journey. So tell us about this uh, master's you did. What was, what, 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 how long was it? Where was it? Uh, what were some of the topics? So it was a one-year program at Boston University, uh, both in Boston and Los Angeles, but that actually got interrupted by the pandemic. Uh, so I was about halfway through my program in Los Angeles when I was on my last roll of toilet paper and had to pack up my stuff uh, and come back to Toronto, uh, which kind of worked out well because it allowed me to reunite with my husband a little earlier. Um, but yeah, it was a one-year program uh, in terms of what we covered. You know, we had uh, one of the courses was very much case-based. We were looking at, you know, Shonda Rhimes, her business and Beyonce's business and, uh, you know, just kind of studying what are the business models in TV and music. Uh, we covered, you know, the evolution of TV. Um, we, we covered how, how does independent film, how do independent films get financed? Uh, it was, yeah, quite a wide range uh, of courses. Sounds fascinating. And tell us, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of your projects uh, in more detail in a, in a bit, but tell us, give us an overview. What, what are some of the projects you've been working on? Yes. So um, I have a number of independent projects that I've done on my own as well, as well as freelance work that I do with clients. But uh, I recently wrapped a short film. Uh, it was, uh, this was something I made during my time in the U S uh, I just got back to Canada, not, uh, not too long ago here in Toronto, but uh have been living in the US for the last couple of years. And it's a commentary on the fragility of the medical insurance system over there. It's called Smile. And it basically starts out, you know, it's a woman has a simple procedure at the orthodontist. There's some sort of issue with her insurance. And as she pursues a resolution, she lands yet another medical bill. Uh, that's 10 times the cost when she gets hit by a car on her way to a very important event. So, um, Yes, the theme is is very much about uh, the corruption <laughs> in, in medical insurance, uh, and that is uh, not available yet. But the trailer is. So if, if anyone wants to check it out and subscribe to my mailing list <laughs> to get updates, it'll be available in the new year. I'd love to. I'd love to see the trailer, if not the whole film. Uh, I used to live in the United States, and let me tell you, when you went to a hospital, you had to bring the credit card, and uh, and as yep. they started to uh, to do different diagnoses of what you needed to have done, you gulped. Um, because of, uh, of even if you had insurance, what the deductibles were for uh, procedure after procedure. So it was, uh, it was really quite interesting. Um, you it's describe terrifying. yourself as a Serbian Canadian filmmaker. Why Serbian Canadian? Do you do films in Serbian as well? Uh, well, I was born in Serbia. I was born in Belgrade uh, and uh, 
so I'm Serbian in ethnicity and uh, Canadian because I grew up in Canada. But not in filmmaking? Uh, no, not so much in filmmaking. I, I do have a project, though, a feature film project that I'm developing that actually is sort of an alternate reality uh, kind of version of my family's immigration story. So hopefully that'll end up being a Serbian-Canadian co-production. Remind me how to we'll pronounce see. your name, Ivana. Ivana Strain. Ivana Strain. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Ivana Stein in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Second and Sixty. We're chatting tonight with Ivana Stein. She's a Serbian Serbian Canadian filmmaker. Uh, interesting story. She uh, had a career in uh, corporate strategy. She had an education in uh, in business, and she left it all to start a career that she's always dreamt of. Uh, in uh, filmmaking. Uh, and she's actually done a master's. What was the master's called? It was a master of science in media ventures. A master's Boston of University. science in media ventures. Sounds fascinating. Yes. I'd like to take it. So I, I, you know, we have a little bit of a similarity. I'm not sure if, uh, if uh, you realize this at all, but I um, um, was fascinated with the entertainment business, not necessarily film, but entertainment business. And uh, my first job after my doing my uh, MBA was with the Walt Disney Company. And yes, uh, I saw I did, that. I did. I worked in Los Angeles as well um, and did uh, a whole bunch of business oriented things uh, in the entertainment and film and, uh, and uh, uh, amusement park, uh, et cetera, business, which was kind of fun. So tell me, um, what did your husband think? What did your parents think? What did your friends think when you said, I'm giving it up, I'm leaving the corporate world, I'm going to become a filmmaker? Uh, well, my husband was not surprised at all. It was something we discussed on our very first date. So, <laughs> and we both kind of, we both kind of shared our, our, you know, visions and dreams for our future. And we, we both kind of stuck to them. So my husband was very supportive, thankfully. Uh, but I would say that everyone else was, was pretty, uh, pretty thought I was insane. <laughs> insane. They thought I was insane. Not just to taking leave, a risk, to leave such a, it, just to, to leave such a, a stable career, uh, for something so uncertain, uh, I think a, a lot of people were very in, shocked. Uh, in media is kind of interesting. Yes, yes. It, I, it was a really great program. I, I loved it, yeah. So um, you've now come back to Toronto and you've launched some independent projects. Uh, what do you think the future is going to be? Well, I'm currently developing another short film and I'm also developing my feature film. So hopefully those will go into production, the short film in the new year and the feature film, uh, only time will tell. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how quickly we can finally uh, make the film. But otherwise, I also do freelance work. So I work with clients um, uh, on, you know, as a writer, director, editor, uh, producer. So uh, I always have client projects on the go as well. Uh, and then I'm always working on, on new material. Tell us a little every about day. both your short uh, film as well as your feature film. What's the, what's the subject? Sure. So the short uh, that I'm going to be uh, making early next year, it's called Unhinged. It's uh, a typical morning goes sideways, basically, for a disconnected husband and wife uh, when they find a joint in their 18-year-old daughter's nightstand after she they've decided that she's gone missing. So they assume that she you know, has had an overdose and died. And uh, they kind of, as they console each other, they end up smoking the joint and, and finally make love after what is probably months or years of abstinence only to be interrupted by their daughter. Uh, so it's very much about love and companionship as salvation. And uh, as you might have gathered from some of the projects I've discussed, I do a lot of dark comedy. So <laughs> hopefully uh, people can see the humor in that. Love and companionship. Yes. Yes. Love and companionship as salvation. Is there a uh, personal story in this? Were you the, uh, the 18 year old or were you the parent? Uh, well, <laughs> if anything, I was, yeah, probably, def I'm not a parent, so couldn't have been the parent, but uh, yes, I would say that definitely uh, as a teenager, especially during university, I did live at home and, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say, it, I'm not going to comment on, <laughs> I mean, I didn't do anything like that. Uh, but, um, but I would say my parents were always very worried about my, so what's, the, what's the, uh, you know, obviously the message of love and compassion is salvation is that love and compassion are salvation, but, but how do you get that across? It, it's this, that the two of them it's, really needed to make love more often. Uh, well, it's essentially this idea that uh, this kind of 
what they have assumed is a tragedy. By the way, the audience knows where the daughter is. So the audience will, will be kind of shown a woman basically turning her phone off to go in for a midterm, uh, which is why she was unreachable and not at home. Um, but essentially, so you see these people kind of spiraling, they're making funeral arrangements and, and, you know, this kind of tragedy, they think that it's this tragedy and you just see it, how it brings them closer together. Um, and so that is kind of, it's, it's, this tragedy ends up kind of being their salvation, even though it's not really a tragedy because she was fine. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people think that uh, this time out that uh, we, the whole world seems to have had for the last 18 months, um, which has been tragic uh, in a lot of uh, ways with, uh, with the deaths and, uh, and uh, the infections and sickness and uh, the impact to the economy and to small business, you know, I could go on, but that a lot of people think that frankly, the time out was healthy and that a lot of people um, have found what's important to them, you know, maybe, uh, not as quickly as you did, but, uh, but found out what was important to them in life and found their passion. And, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, McKinsey just last week, uh, wrote a big article about the great resignation that how so many different people are leaving jobs that were unfulfilling. And it's right. sort of this, you know, are you uh, working to live or living to work and, uh, that the living to work, um, attitude uh, of no boundaries, uh, maybe not as uh, appetizing, um, and maybe not just for millennials, which is what sort of uh, people thought it was initially, but for a lot of people that came to the realization during the time out where they were had to stay at home, um, was healthy, which is something they really wanted. And then at the same time, some people realized the people they were stuck in the house with weren't the people they wanted to be with all the time. So good and bad in that regard. Right, right. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I think, um, obviously, uh, I mean, it's been a, a difficult time for, for everybody and, and certainly more difficult for some than others. Um, definitely have a lot of empathy for those who have, you know, lost family members or, um, you know, kind of struggled financially through this, not being able to work. Uh, so certainly want to empathize with that. But, um, but for me, I, I was kind of in that privileged position where I was a student. So, um, I kind of already had kind of budgeted for this year of, of experimentation and, and figuring out uh, exactly what I wanted to pursue. And honestly, a part of me, I don't know if the pandemic hadn't hit, maybe I would have forced myself uh, or pressured myself to get more of a corporate job in entertainment as opposed to pursuing a creative career. So that's your, uh, your short film, which is called Unhinged. What about your long yes. feature? Uh, yeah, so it's called The Immigrants, uh, it, and this is the one that is uh, an alternate reality kind of story of, of my family's immigration. So it takes place in 1993. Uh, a wife, husband, and toddler start their journey to immigrate to Canada from Serbia, uh, but they get separated at the Serbian-Hungarian border. The husband actually gets conscripted to war, and the wife decides ultimately to go through with the plan and immigrate to Canada alone with her toddler, where she struggles to find a job in her field as an engineer. Uh, and it's just very much about that identity kind of crisis that she faces, um, you know, with this new identity of, of an immigrant and, and not a working engineer. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the one that stays true is, or the identities that, that stay are mother and, and wife. Um, and so sort of a, a alternate reality version, we were able to immigrate as a family, uh, but it was possible at one point that my dad would be conscripted to the war. So thankful he wasn't. How was the immigrant experience for you? Well, I, I was a toddler, so I don't have the, you know, lived experience, but certainly kind of talking in depth with my parents, uh, it sounds like it was very, very difficult for the first, certainly the first five years, uh, maybe even 10, just to, to get jobs in their field. They're both engineers. Uh, they had to, you know, take extra courses to get the accreditation here, despite kind of earning points in the immigration system where, you know, they were coming with master's uh, in engineering, uh, and, and both spoke a good amount of English, uh, when they arrived, but it was just, it sounds like it was, you know, it was just very difficult for them to, to get jobs in their fields and, uh, make a living, but it ended up, uh, working out for them. They're very happy and successful now. So, and, uh, in your film would, uh, would the, uh, protagonist, the, the, the mother, um, go back to Serbia if she could, or did she end up being happy and successful in Canada? 
Uh, she doesn't go back. She, uh, she does end up, I wanted to have a happy ending. So she does kind of, she does end up landing her job and, uh, and, you know, I don't want to give too much away about the ending. <laughs> I want to allow for, uh, you know, once the film is made for people to, to get to experience it. But so. this idea of identity um, is really an interesting one. And uh, I've heard it from numerous different people that, uh, and, you know, maybe it's a negative in our society that so much of identity is wrapped up in what we do day in and mm -hmm. day out. But that uh, if, if you were a master's of engineering in Serbia and all of a sudden you're a taxi driver or whatever it is that you're able to get when you come to Canada because you're Canadian, because your foreign credentials aren't recognized in Canada, that can be really damaging to people's personal attitudes about themselves, self-image. Yeah. And how does she deal with that? Uh, I mean, it, that's what the film kind of explores is, is her struggle with, with taking on these various jobs. Uh, you know, it's kind of up to the audience. I don't necessarily want to prescribe. Uh, she, she deals with it in her way. She struggles through it and, and ultimately uh, kind of realizes what her identity is truly about, which is, has nothing to do with her job actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it is, a, it's definitely the way that our society seems to work, uh, which is, you know, your job is your identity uh, when really it should be about how good of a person you are and, and, you know, your contributions to your community, I think. Um, no so, question. No question. Yeah. Um, what about your parents? How did they deal with that uh, loss of identity for a while? Um, I mean, you'd have to ask them. <laughs> I don't want to speak on their behalf. <laughs> so what, what suggestions then, if you don't want to speak on their behalf, uh, would you have for people that are immigrating? Uh, I was at a, uh, an Afghan refugee event uh, just the other night. And, uh, and they talked about how, um, you know, that, that shock of, uh, of different country, of uh, different religion, different political system, um, and no job uh, for a while uh, can end up being, you know, even though you've escaped what was a terrible situation, the current situation has got some challenges associated with it. How do you deal with that? What, what, what suggestions have you got for people? For sure. I mean, I, I don't know that I could ever have any advice for someone going through something like that in a refugee experience. That's so, so difficult. Uh, but I don't know, I can only really speak to, you know, whenever I've kind of moved to a new city, you know, even moving to the US, I mean, it was different circumstances, it was for school. But you know, you do kind of feel like you're starting from scratch in a new city. And uh you know, you have your classmates, but you don't really, it's almost like you're kind of only there temporarily, you know, it's this temporary, you feel like it's this temporary moment and you're sort of passing through and um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have advice for dealing with it other than to try to focus on, you know, who you are outside of. Well, let me ask you about your own identity. You know, you, you said you came here as a toddler, you immigrated here as a toddler. Um, why do you describe yourself as Serbian Canadian, not just Canadian or not just Serbian? Well, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I will say it was definitely an identity crisis. I've had many cr crises of identity throughout, throughout my life, uh, you know, between even just, uh, when I'm I studied commerce filmmaker. Yeah, exactly. When I studied, you know, commerce, I didn't really feel like I fit in because everyone else wanted to be, you know, a banker or a consultant or, you know, and I was like, I still want to be a filmmaker. I'm just here to get some other skills. Uh, so I didn't really feel like I fit in. And then in the corporate world, I didn't fit in because I knew I wanted to be an artist and now I'm an artist. And I felt, I feel like I, I'm, I focus too much on the numbers maybe. Um, but, and, and certainly with my identity of being Serbian and Canadian, you know, I, I very much grew up with, you know, Serbian traditions at, at home and Serbian food and a certain way that we, we are with each other. We're just all very blunt and, and honest and, and we say exactly what we mean. And there's no kind of hidden meaning or subtext. Uh, whereas, you know, there's a lot more of walking on eggshells, I think, uh, you know, with some of my Canadian friends. Uh, and so sometimes that can be a bit of a, a culture clash <laughs> at times. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I am also Canadian because when I go back to Serbia, there are certain aspects of, uh, you know, of their experience that that I haven't lived through. And so, um, yeah, so I'm both Serbian and Canadian. I'm, I'm at that intersection. 
We're chatting tonight with Ivana Stryan. She's a Serbian Canadian filmmaker that left a career in corporate strategy to become a creative force in Canada. We're going to take a break and come back more with Ivana in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Having a fun chat tonight with uh, Ivana Stryan. She's a Serbian Canadian filmmaker. She left a career in corporate strategy to pursue a career in uh, a creative career as an independent writer, director, and editor. Um, Ivana, what's the biggest risk you've taken in your career? Has it been giving up the corporate strategy job and becoming a going back to school for for media? Yes, that is definitely the biggest risk that I've taken. It was it was pretty terrifying, especially because the rational part of my brain uh, that I had, uh, and and sort of the numbers oriented part of my brain that uh, you know was kind of trained that I I guess I trained my brain to think about numbers and, and statistics and you know the likelihood of things working out, and it sort of felt like you know, the people who succeed in entertainment, it just felt like such a small percentage of people actually succeed and, or can make a career and make a living in the industry. And um, so I did feel like it was a huge risk to leave behind what was a very stable career. I had had a lot of growth. I progressed, you know, in that career ladder pretty quickly um, and, and held a pretty senior position by the time I was, I was leaving. So it did feel like a huge risk to kind of go into completely, you know, into a completely new field where I had pretty much no connections. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm really happy that, that I took that risk in the end. I, I didn't want to have regrets later in life and wonder what no regrets. if. I, so I firmly believe in that uh, worth it. adage of no regrets. But, but it's yes. interesting studying people like you that have taken that, uh, that leap of faith. Uh, and I, I want to probe, if I could, uh, you know, what, uh, what were the key elements of it? Uh, and it sounds to me like one of them was that you always knew film or entertainment was a passion and you did sort of a test market in it by doing it um, a little bit in the evenings while you're still doing your, your corporate job. Uh, and then number two, uh, you know, obviously the support of your, uh, your spouse was, was critically important. Um, is that right? And, and, uh, and what else were the critical factors in you deciding that this is what you wanted to do and then being comfortable with taking the risk. Right. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I had always known that I wanted to be a storyteller, really, even from an early age, it's sort of, it's become a bit cliche now, because I think I've heard so many people say this in interviews, but it, so it's somewhat cliche to say it, but I was that kind of trope of a kid who was always directing plays with family friends and putting on performances for the parents, you know, that was something and, you know, we even made short films back then, uh, that are, Actually, you know what? One of them was pretty good. If the production value was a little higher, that one would have been pretty good. All, well, not really, actually. I take that back. But um, I don't know. I just really loved creating. I loved storytelling. And I really, I think for me, it just felt like my purpose. It felt like the way that I connect to people is through stories. Uh, so, and, and I don't really know of any other way uh, other than uh, through storytelling. So. Okay. So, so you knew that your passion was storytelling. But still, giving up the corporate job and taking the risk was a big risk. How did you do it? How did I did do it? Did you do well, like a decision tree? Did you do like an NPV analysis? Did you, uh, <laughs> did you like, uh, um, you know, flip a coin? Did you debate it at night until three o'clock in the morning with your husband? Like, tell me how you did it. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of talking about it with my husband and with pretty much anyone who would listen. <laughs> uh, but I think it just kind of came down to, I, I just was so unhappy. I, I was just so, so unhappy. Um, in my corporate job, I knew I needed, I knew something needed to change. And uh, I think I just kind of, it really, there was no, it, it I had to throw all logic out the window basically, because there was no logical reason to pursue it other than the desire to not have any regrets something um, you wanted to do and you, yeah and it was you, just in something fact, it sounds yeah. like you moved away from your husband for a year or or a good long time well we did yeah we, we were in a long distance marriage basically for uh six months uh, but at least in the boston portion that's pretty close to toronto so we were back and forth we that was one thing we took for granted prior to the pandemic was how easy it was to travel um, so we were, we were flying back and forth a decent amount. And then he was actually supposed to join me in Los Angeles for a few months before he started 
grad school as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, there, there was definitely sacrifice involved. Uh, so maybe you can tell me, and, you know, frankly, both from your, your educational experience, as well as from your current uh, practical experience, what are some of the trends that, uh, are occurring? You know, you mentioned, uh, film festivals, uh, virtual film festivals, hybrid festivals, streamers, what, what's going on? What do we, what should we be looking out for? Right. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess where I was kind of coming from was uh, as a result of the pandemic, a, a lot had to change and uh, a lot of uh, film festivals sort of had to, I, I wouldn't even say modernize their approach, but they had to get much more technically savvy because in order for a festival to even operate, it, they had to find a way to be either completely virtual or at least offer a hybrid model. And for me, I think that's something because it's not always you know, it's not always possible to travel to go to a festival. And as a, a filmmaker, I also love watching films. And so anyone who who also loves watching films, you might not be able to get on every plane to go to every festival to see, you know, all the premieres of all these great films that are, uh, you know, holding their premieres at all these festivals around the world. But to have some sort of a virtual option, a way to enjoy it at home, I think is great, even though I know there's a lot of debate about, you know, a theatrical release and seeing films in a theater. And of course, uh, I'm all for that, but I'm also practical. And sometimes it's nice to be able to watch films from the comfort of your own home um, and kind of see them before there's been, uh, there have been reviews. I personally, I don't know, it, I guess it's also a question of personal taste. I prefer to watch a film and make my own judgment rather than uh, read reviews first because it, it tends to ruin the film for me <laughs> if something's overhyped. But. What about the impact of streamers and streaming? Yeah, I mean, they've definitely become, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, everyone, we were kind of headed in that way and in, in that direction anyways. A lot more people were, you know, subscribed to one or more uh, of, of these streaming uh, services. Uh, there's certainly, I mean, in the U.S., there's a lot of fragmentation in that market. In Canada, I think it's sort of starting to happen where it's becoming a little bit more fragmented. So now it's almost becoming kind of like uh, what cable ended up doing to TV, where you just you ended up having to have, uh, you know, all these different channels added to your package. And it was all super fragmented. Um, and, and now that's kind of happening with all these new streaming services popping up. Uh, and all these different ones that you have to have access to because there's always some sort of must watch television or, or a film that you really need to see and it's only available on that one streaming service so it's becoming very fragmented um, so I guess for audiences that's probably a pain point that at some point uh, will need to be resolved because so if, if you did a film today um, where's the best place to launch it is it uh, at a film festival is it uh in uh, wide release in theaters across North America? Is it um, on uh, mainstream TV? Is it on cable channels? Um, is it on a streaming service? Well, I mean, it really depends on, I think the film and the goal. So um, I think theatrical releases are incredibly expensive and I think it takes a certain kind of film with very mass appeal in order to draw audiences in to those uh, theatrical releases. So, you know, if you release a film that for one reason or another, it just doesn't have mass appeal and doesn't draw audiences, you end up losing a lot of money by taking that approach. And, um, and so some films find the, those markets uh, better or, or more effectively through a streamer and can end up being much more uh that can, can be a much more, uh, I guess, financially viable approach. Um, but certainly like the action films, the superhero films, those will always, I think, draw a huge audience theatrically. Okay, what about financing? You said that you uh, actually took courses in the financing of films, uh, you know, a couple of uh, decades ago when I was at Disney, um, I was working on Silver Screen Partners and, uh, and the trend there was limited partnerships where you could uh, have investors that uh, like a REIT um, um, could take the loss uh, to the regular income and, uh, and the income uh, to the regular income uh, long-term and it was structured as a limited partnership so there was no double right. taxation. Um, and, uh, and you syndicated out uh, a package of films to, uh, to people because the economics were such that uh, four or five uh, out of uh, 
of six films were no good and one would be a blockbuster and you'd lose money on four or five right. and you'd make money on the one. So you always right. wanted to, to sell to people uh, an investment in a package of films. What's mm-hmm. What are sort of some of the ideas of how you finance films today? Right, right. Yeah. And for studios, that makes sense because they have such you know, large budgets to work with. And and I mean, it's sort of like in venture capital as well, you know, that venture capital companies invest in all these different startups and they only really need a handful of them to, to kind of have successful exits in order for the VC to see their return and, and then some, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, I guess for, for independent, for filmmakers, I guess what, what is important to know is that there's a studio deal, which is just a one check deal uh, you know, here's the check from this big studio and you, and it's all the money you need to make the film and then some, and then they handle the marketing, the distribution, et cetera. But for independent films, it's everything else, anything where it involves putting together financing from all these different pieces, that's an independent film. Um, and so there are kind of three tranches. Uh, and, and so the first tranche is basically, um, going, you know, putting together the package, having the script, having all the attachments. So, Uh, I mean, if you're the filmmaker, maybe you wrote and directed it. Maybe you have a great producer attached actors, you know, key talent, that's kind of your package. And then you get a sales agent and the sales agent takes that package uh, to film festival markets. So, uh, you know, TIFF has a film festival market where there are industry meetings happening. Um, A lot of film festivals have these markets on the side. And, uh, and essentially the sales agent goes to distributors of various countries and sells kind of um, this, this idea of what this film will be uh, to these distributors. And if they like what they see, they might say, hey, you know, we represent, um, you know, all theaters in Spain and we like this or we'll buy the digital rights for this in Spain or insert whatever country here. Um, and, uh, and so you'll basically collect all these LOIs and you take, or sorry, letter, letters of intent from, from, you know, these distributors and kind of put together, you know, wh- whatever that adds up to is kind of what you can then take to the bank to get the money that you need to make the film. So maybe you collect a couple million dollars that way and you make, you know, you make a film for that amount. Uh, and that valuation can range depending on how much interest you have. So that's kind of the first tranche and it's the lowest risk for the bank because you have these letters of intent. And as long as you deliver on your promise, um, you, you know, you, you have distribution kind of lined up, locked in and, and the money's there. So um, borrowing money against future revenue. Exactly. Okay. So you're not exactly. taking equity investors or no, partners. no. So, yeah. So then the next tranche is basically where you have these film financing companies who, you know, they have their models for, you know, they also will look at the package. They have their own models and they are actually taking, you know, a stake in the film. uh, And they, uh, and this is where you might have these kinds of arrangements that you've discussed. Um, And, uh, and that's also, you know, so that's, there's more risk associated with that because there isn't a, you know, there isn't future revenue that's guaranteed with that, um, but still less risky because generally these people know what they're doing. Uh, and then the third tranche are just private investors. And, you know, there are varying uh, degrees of savviness with private investors. And so, but they'll probably also want to see what's the package, you know, what that uh, what is this film ultimately going to look like? And that's the highest risk category in terms of getting their money back. I want to check out your films and lots of our viewers uh, and listeners might want to do that. How do we uh, check you out? Uh, Do you have a website? I do. Yes. Uh, The easiest way to find me is on my website, evanastrain.com. I could spell it out. If you could. Sure. I-V-A-N-A-S-T-R-A-J-I-N.com. Van Australian, thank you so much for joining us tonight and telling us a little bit about your uh, conversion from corporate strategist to creative, uh, creative force in Canada, um, Serbian uh, Canadian filmmaker, uh, Ivana Stranjan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. That's our show for pleasure. tonight, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye.